you're new in town or just new to this whole podcast thing, you're tuning in to Law by Night, the podcast that discusses all things vampiric with no fear of breaching the masquerade. In this episode, we shall review Blood Sigils, a source book for Vampire the Masquerade 5th edition. I shall present my thoughts and opinions on its presentation and mechanics to help you better decide whether this is the source book for you. Vampire the Masquerade 5th edition or V5 or version 5 if you are a fucking weirdo brought about many changes to the lore, setting, metaplot and mechanical foundations of the game and the storyteller system as a result. Many people liked these changes whilst a lot didn't which is totally fine. I like some of the changes like willpower and the hunger system and I don't like how the amogams have become an overly complicated fetch quest of pre-requests to get that exact power you wish for your character to have. I enjoy V5 and V20, something I feel far too many people miss out on or selectively forget. One of the many changes that 5th edition brought was the structure and feel of the Tremere and Banu Hakim, the Asamites, via the smashing together of their former turgical practices under one occasionally vague descriptor, blood sorcery. In addition to the introduction of Finn Blood Alchemy, a form of blood sorcery practiced by, you guessed it, the Finn Blooded. Again, many people did not like this change, but a lot of people feel the reduction and, dare I say, elimination of the various former turgical paths was needed to make it easier for people to approach the Tremere, making it less bloated in the process. For every person who thinks this, there are just as many who requested or demanded the return of these paths dedicated to their own book. Which leads me to the focus of this review, Blood Sigils, the third most recent V5 book published at the time of writing. 1st of April 2024. Released on the 20th of October 2023, Blood Sigils is the V5 sourcebook about blood sorcery and thin blooded alchemy, claiming to explore the underground blood magic scene and provide guidance on how to incorporate it into a chronicle. Naturally, it includes additional thin blood alchemy formula and blood sorcery rituals and introduces systems for creating unique formula and rituals and more. I honestly didn't expect much given the poor quality of the last few V5 books Renegade have put out, but as I do with every book I review, I go in with fresh eyes and have been as fair as I feel is warranted. To that end, how good of a job does Blood Sigils do on providing what it sets out to do, or is it just another joke? But before we dive into the book review proper, here are the rules to the Law by Night book reviews. I will explore snippets of the law, mechanics and rules found within the tome. I will look as to how they are presented and easily they are conveyed to new and old players alike. As this is a review written and presented by me, all thoughts and opinions are my own, so if you disagree with something I have said, that is totally fine. It does not mean that you're right and I'm wrong and vice versa. Whilst Blood Sigils is now available as a PDF and physical tome, hardback, I only possess it as a PDF which has a notably large file size, something that still puzzles me to this day. As it is only the PDF version I own, I cannot make the usual comments on what the book feels and looks like. That said, my second hand tablet, which is where I'm storing the PDF, says you lost the game. The front cover of the book is incredibly striking with a very plain, rounded font spelling out the title. The cover art by Mark Kelly expertly draws the potential reader in immediately to the aggressive vampire's face, fangs bared with strange symbols on their head, before leading the reader's eyes outwards to the interesting blue, purple and mostly red swells like a vampiric hypnotist wheel, enticing the reader to expand one's mind and perception to the occult, to mentally prepare for the dark blood based secrets within. It's something I thought quite a lot about so it is clearly a cover that struck out with me a few months ago now. It is also awesome seeing a person of colour dominate the front cover, taking centre stage. This isn't the only cool bit of representation in this book but we'll touch base with that in a moment. The back cover is a similar to more recent V5 source books and Fall of London, that V5 marble with the camera unk running down the page with a blurb overview in the text within. The colour of the marble this time around is a dark hue which I am rather fond of. That specific shade of blue, not quite navy and not quite royal blue, is my favourite colour of blue. The presentation of the book feels similar to other World of Darkness books by Renegade and the one Modifius tone before them and yet notably different. Perhaps 
Perhaps a small detail to some, but besides the very average introductory story, there are no poorly placed blood splatters or spatter, depending on how clever you wish to be. What replaces the previous copy and paste job is plenty of artwork and tables, leaving very little room for the text to breathe by itself, which can be a bit much at times, but the art does a great job at highlighting the different ways blood sorcery is used, learnt and exchanged, both of which we will explore later in this review. Returning to the artwork, I have to admit that I am pleasantly surprised. Besides one piece found on page 42, there isn't a bad piece on anything that makes me question whether it was illustrated by an actual person or AI, which is not something I thought I would ever have to write, but here we are, I suppose. Besides the front cover, Mark Kelly's work is not as constant as a presence here as it has been in previous books, but serves the purpose of dividing the book into two parts, which we will look at shortly. The titles are rather hit and miss, as we have illustrations with white text plastered on there somewhere, which honestly looks a bit cheap, particularly the ones on page 58 where the text is just difficult, almost impossible to read, and one on page 98 which looks blurry, like the image has been blown up to the wrong proportions and the vampiric proportions themselves looking a bit off themselves. Other 5th edition regulars such as Raquel Cornero and Christoph Bionwiski return, both doing superb jobs of capturing the vampire in 5th edition iteration of the World of Darkness particularly Raquel, but I am a little biased here as I prefer Raquel's style over Kristoff's, though there are two of his pieces I particularly love. One on page 20 because goth, and the one on page 30, a large woman with crutches, a loud and bold statement that overweight vampires do exist, but disabled ones too, and I just know that seeing someone with crutches in a TTRPG book would make a load of weirdos angry, to which I say, stay mad and cope. One of the artists in this book is Joe Cavalina, who you may recognise if you read the Anarch book. She is the artist who did the very large and striking pieces that could be tattoo designs. If that doesn't help, the Anarch salubri, you know which one I mean now. This brought me much joy as I had missed her style in VTM and glad she's getting to make her mark some more within the world of darkness. Sadly, there are very few pieces of her here and it mostly captures a small scene with the same individual. I would have loved to have seen a bit more variety from her, hopefully next time. Once you have opened the book and read the aforementioned chapter, you are greeted with a standard introductory chapter that details what it aims to cover and what you will find inside. The introduction wastes no time to try and redefine the culture surrounding blood sorcery, making it more a secretive street level like people dealing drugs than the secretive stuffy bookworm studying an ancient text archetype that any Tremere and Asamite fan would recognise, which honestly makes sense. Vampire the Masquerade, from a player's perspective, has always focused on the upcoming neonate, rising above their challenging elders, doing their best to break free from the shackles of the jihad, but constrained by the chains of stagnation and tradition of said elders. 5th edition puts a microscope and burns their ant nests, doing away with a lot of these structures, breaking up the orders of old, but keeping the magic alive somehow. This especially makes sense when you consider the development of the culture of the Thin-Blooded that serves as their own faction rather than the clan that 5th edition pretends they are. Nobody wants them and they are left alone and hunted, so secrecy and makeshift crack dens are in order to come up and experiment with their own sorcery. The only things they'd write down are the things they need, like an undead shopping list, if that. The Blood Mages, or Red Worker, to use the stupid nickname this book introduces via the lexicon or to quote the book, <laughs> magic words, are not so much a secret society practicing a cult but more sketchy occult game doing red working, another dumb fucking name. Personal jabs aside, this shift in focus is a potentially interesting shift, serving to make blood sorcery more approachable for the newer player, but whether it lives up to that is a different matter entirely. One way it doesn't do this is by how it addresses the structure of the book. First, it makes it clear that what it is for the player and the storyteller, which is all fine and dandy. The sections of the book are divided up into scenes and secrets, the former aimed for players and secrets for the ST. In between these two, we have an overview of each chapter, each one named after a tarot card, which may put people off if they're not fans of astrology, and a mature content warning box of the page 7, reminding people that drugs are indeed bad as well as the usual stuff one needs to warm newbies when it comes to vampire. It does tell the reader to go and check out the considered play section written by Jack 
Alvin Brick, whose work has not been plagiarised or summarised in this book but merely referenced, a slightly step backwards from what had happened in the most recent of Renegade's books. I suppose it is slightly less shitty to go and point the readers to the original text rather than reprint it and not credit and pay them for it. In true Renegade fashion, the first proper chapter of the book presents the readers with a variety of NPC stats and archetypes which, as a reminder, was supposed to be for players, so we are already going off to a great start, as this is one of the many inconsistencies and faults with its presentation. But to focus on the chapter itself, 17 pages of some 39 individuals provide the future blood sorcerer plenty of templates to build their character around, even if they totally ignore the general difficulties and dice pools for them. Using the available information to build blood sorcerers and thin blood alchemists coming from different angles and modes of conducting their research. For example, the collector template has varying write ups. Those who do not have any use for what they find and they just hoard shite demand the power or know there is a market and sell it off to the highest bidder, each one with their own personal and emotional flaws, teasing the brain for many roleplay opportunities, which doesn't limit itself to the three, technically two and a half vampire types known for their blood sorcerers. The last example has even more templates to play with, either as inspiration for PCs but primarily for STs. That said, I feel a few STs would have to choose carefully who they are going to employ as most of these NPCs do feel like tough opponents for most groups who assume the mantle of neonates. Keep this in mind because it will come up later in this review. Whizzing past the NPCs, the short formula for tricking people that mortal blood is vampire blood, an interesting mechanic for making mutual circles more a secretive social event, the chapter discusses the possible locations to drop your blood sources in for quests, havens and whatever the imagination inspires, each one with different social flavours, many of which have mechanics attached to them, akin to the different places in Chicago by night, but on a much smaller smaller and thus narrower scale. What follows are ideas and suggestions with a few mechanics on how to gamify the searching of ingredients for rituals, alchemy or specific powers, and how to know whether to focus a session or a chronicle on it, not just have it be determined off screen, which is something I feel should have gone in a later chapter, but I suppose having it here for players to read does emphasise the more street level aspect of blood sorcery now and not everyone has a chantry to fall back on, if they are generous enough to even comply. Whether you have to scavenge, buy or haggle, the different ways one can obtain the goods is explored in varying details. And of course, boons are mentioned too, which I appreciate as they are easy to forget in most sessions of VTM. Most of this section is perfect for new players who feel they can get what they want when they want or STs that tend to hand wave a lot of details or not give a lot of thought to the nitty gritty. I do not feel that it adds enough for more experienced STs to ponder about, though the kettle Battle, which is basically an alchemy or ritual brewing competition, is essentially a hip hop rap off twist, grabbing my interest of all of five seconds. What I feel is more useful is how the chapter ends, presenting a relationship map of the structure but for blood sorcery and how everyone connects together who the user is, whose interest, whose teaches, and so on and so forth. Again, experienced STs may not get much out of the information presented, but the way it is presented might help them work out the logistics this underground culture has. That said, I do find the increasing amount of maps with each stage of the example to be increasingly messy and confusing to dissect, so I suppose it captures that handwritten relationship map feel particularly in that it will make a lot of total sense to the person who designed it, but leaving everyone else a moment or two to catch up in their brainwaves. The next chapter has a large selection of blood sorcery rituals and thin blood alchemy formula, so everyone who wanted new powers or paths are going to be very, very disappointed. Feeling World of Darkness wouldn't listen, which is very on par with them. People wanted the Sabaton V5 to play and explore their twisted descent into vampiric savagery, and here we got confusing NPCs and inconsistent information. The player's guide was meant to explore role-playing the different clans and collect all the available discipline powers up to that point in one place, but presented some of the predator types, missing out one intentionally and throwing a bunch of additional things no one asked or wanted. But I digress. There is no denying that the vast majority of rituals and formula are overpowered to the point of feeling unbalanced and broken. Most of these are levels 1 to 3, with 4 and 5th levels lacking the same punch and engagement of the ones before it, as if the developers exhausted their creativity.
creativity in the early ones and lost their steam in the latter ones, or made them rushed for whatever reason. This is especially true for the Thin Blood Alchemy, which in some instances make their own talents more dangerous than those of the fully fleshed vampire. Once again, pushing a narrative that V5 players really should experience playing Thin Bloods in their games and are missing out on what they feel is the true experience of 5th edition. In others, they can break the established canon of the game, mainly becoming tattoo artists because that constant collective whine from piss baby fans who don't like their undead character whose body is stuck in a supernatural stasis had to be addressed? This is one of the many instances of why it is okay as a creative to sometimes exercise the command no. And before anyone says anything, yes I am aware of the V20 combo discipline that allows one to do something very similar to this, but that is through vicissitude, and I am more tolerant of that than twink blood magic. But to return to the chapter at hand, I have a suggestion as to why this may be the case. It has been highlighted in many different places and means that most group for any game surrounding and have nothing to do with VTM average at about 6 sessions. For Vampire, most players are not going to be able to get any power beyond the third level, especially if you use the rule as written in the core book and only award one singular experience point per session. I feel the developers and lead of this project realised this and addressed it by making the powers here more exciting and engaging than any V5 book before it, to make blood sourcing more exciting for players, making effects more potent and damage more, well, damaging. Whilst a later section of this book would remind and highlight that the time it takes for a red worker to learn and hone their craft, this particular outcome to make powers with more punch is not only a somewhat childish way to handle things, but it highlights a point I have made with Renegade's previous VTM books, that they are trying to emulate a more D&D feel to make characters feel like badasses, not through their actions, but by mechanical crunch, which is also at odds with the message of this book up until this point. More potentially broken material can be found in the side bottom page 71 with the Chained Rituals, where it is now possible to cast multiple rituals at once, where it was never possible before, which is a further destruction of the established canon. Blood sorcerers can achieve powerful workings by casting compatible rituals in a chained ritual. This involves using at least three rituals, with one level 5 ritual serving as the linchpin. When all rituals are cast within 10 meters of each other, the chained effect of the linchpin level 5 ritual activates. However, all the rituals must succeed for the change ritual to take effect, and a single failure breaks the chain. It is a terribly risky and something that not a lot of players will have access to during the Chronicle, as one of the key parts to this is possessing a level 5 ritual and then not failing the roll once. The level 5 rituals, or two of them, yes two, contain a chain section about what happens when it's changed to one of the other sorceries, but not with some of the others, which doesn't make it that much easier for the SD to work out how to apply this outside of those two specific examples, and most blood sorcerers who possess that level 5 blood sorcery can only use one of the chained effects mentioned. Put a pin in that, we'll come back to that. The chapter ends with an informative and mostly well thought out section on how to conjure up your own rituals and formulae, pun intended. It breaks down what each level should feel like and the basic differences between a fully fledged ritual and the grubby thin blood alchemy, which I have mixed feelings about. I'm reminded on the revised book The Time of Thin Blood, which has tools for creating unique disciplines. Both sections of both books relies on players being sensible with the scaling or properly appreciating the finer details details of balance of it all, which is no easy feat. Similar comments can be made to the ST2, of course, like a dungeon master handing out that too powerful weapon or spell to the budding adventurer, but it also presents creators the ideas and tools to recreate this old school former liturgical path if they so wish, which does feed into the let the fans mod it to it breaks ideology. However, one of the paths did get a feature in this book, and those who have read it know exactly what I'm speaking of. For those who don't, I refer to Coldonic Sorcery, which was a sudden surprise when it was teased in a preview way back when. I like to say that it was less surprising in the context of the book, but this is the first proper mentioning of it, with the only hint that Coldonic Sorcery is in the book was a brief definition of Coldon in the lexicon, which is simply as the meatsy blood sorcerer. There is no mention of the cultures, the practices or the ties to the land, 
not much on the relationship between mentor or pupil, the chronios, or the different environmental effects, just some vague descriptors of what it could do. Four elemental themed rituals, only a blood sorcering wielding Zemitsi can do, there is only a level 5 ritual as there isn't a level 1 or 4 rituals and all are quite frankly a mess. Base unavoidable aggravated damage for regular Coldonic sorcery which the target can only perceive not avoid, the level 2 power does constant unavoidable superficial damage that depending on the successes one can get can kill someone very fucking quickly and continues to do so till the Coldon does something else, level 3 rituals in the pr is practically the same as earth mail but with some obfuscate peppered in there for good measure, and the previously mentioned level 5 ritual is the one ritual with a chain effect that only Coldons can use, so within this book, blood sorcerers not associated with the Zemitsi can only use one of these chained effects. It's honestly impressive how they renegade and World of Darkness can continue to fuck up established material so fucking much. Finally we move on to the third chapter and enter part 2 of the book, The Secrets, which covers a topic I thought I would never see in a V5 book ever again. Law. Yeah, you heard that right. L-O-R-E. Law. There is a brief history on blood sorcery, how it came to be, or rather, various ideas and musings of who and what created it, how the Tremere and Asamites ran with it, and how they, along with the thin blooded, adapted it in today's world. Whilst it wasn't anything new or groundbreaking, it was a little shock that brought a smile to my face that someone somewhere somehow was able to put in some fucking world building, putting a reason as to how and why blood sorcery exists. But it's not just those three that practice it, or rather, it doesn't just have to be them. Some example clans are touched upon, giving players and ST some potential ideas of making a Brujar blood mage or one belonging to the Toreadors. Unfortunately, such ideas don't exactly stretch the imagination. The Brujar our example is focused on being strong and to the bitterness of Carthage. The Malkavian one is boringly esoteric and weird cause hashtag Malkavian things. The Ministry example is about revealing the truths and so forth. Stereotypes work for newbie players but not for anyone else who has read the core book and all the books of the clans were introduced. The most interesting part of the chapter for me is the history of thin blood alchemy, changing some of the meta plot a bit to accommodate this. Its fruitions can be found or suggested to be the early 80s, again putting this new idea for 5th edition a place in the world beyond the simple this is the thing now. Again, like the history of blood sorcery, there really isn't a lot here, which partly makes sense given the nature and culture of the Duskborn and how relatively young they are, but as an ST that is reading the 5th edition books with the last two, Blood Sigils and the Player's Guide, putting a focus on the thin bloods as supposedly fun things to play regularly, I want something a bit more substantial to work with, to throw at my players, to make them fear them a bit more beyond my own cool sense of human style of st -ing. Give me the deeds you fucking cowards! Chapter 4 is titled Movers and Shakers, which presents some large figures and groups that are interested in blood sorcery for one reason or another, following the framework of the first chapter, which is why I felt that chapter should have belonged here. It is an overwhelming chapter, filled with a lot of information to consider, change and ignore however you please to fit in within your own chronicles, fit with their own how to use X character group in a scene or chronicle. Despite the previous chapter having some focus on the other clans, we snap back to the Tremere and Banu Hakim having the vast majority of movers and shakers, though I'm not I'm not entirely sure if one of them is even a vampire at all. I am assuming that she is. The character in question is Mrs. Trahopra, who is honestly one of the more interesting of the cast here. The next chapter is a bit of a hodgepodge chapter filled with more baddies and the like to throw at players, or in other terms, NPCs and their character sheets, but this time in the form of antagonists. And what better V5 antagonist to start with the poster childs of V5 antagonists themselves, the Sabat. All two templates. The Noddist and Sunburner, the Latin being a thin blood on the path of sun. It was honestly a disappointing start as one would have hoped the bit of information how the Sabat would use blood sorcery in their confusing contradicting conquest but it seems to be an extension of what we have read before which is, as I said, rather disappointing. At least, the consistency of not knowing what to do with the Sabat in the V5 is everly persistent. There is an array of vampire and mortal templates that suffer similar complaints to the starting NPCs in that power balance is at best mythical. The chapter 
chapter then presents a bunch of creatures that one can summon, known as Apelu, which I probably butchered horrifically, which has a whole Banu Hakim myth surrounding it. This is the closest thing that the traditional Paths of Legacy editions of VTM has, and it was very odd that this is something so overtly supernatural in this fairly grounded sourcebook, creatures so overtly supernatural that don't really scale linearly either, with the godlike Pashum, to paraphrase the description, has level 6 dots in Clan Disciplines, which if you've forgotten, is not a thing in 5th edition, and don't try and take it on head on either, it has 15 dice to roll for Brawl, and the summoner immediately loses a point of humanity, so that's fucking fun. Most of these homunculi and other oddities just feel very out of place for the world of darkness I thought they, the developers, were wanting to create, devoid of all the cheesy monstrosities, but I guess ridiculous is okay when they do it. One creature I did admire is still trying to work out how to implement into my own games is the Beast Shard, however, is a lot more interesting, which you can read at your own leisure. The most offending of these creatures, I believe, is the turning of gargoyles into ghouls, which serves functionally and mechanically as gargoyles, but they are just a special type of ghoul. Its write-up is on page 133, and it talks about the gargoyle in its original concept, but no! Special ghouls. The return of the gargoyles to V5 was something that was requested, but once again, V5 took fan feedback and created a much worse version, and knowing my own love for the gargoyles, that one hurt quite a bit, I'm not going to lie. The chapter carries on with artifacts, tomes and bizarre mysteries to focus the chronicle around as props to collect or avoid, depending on the thing in question. Similar to the above creatures, the mysteries portions feels oddly out of place with this high humanity, low supernatural world of darkness. There are conversations on a blood serpent called Tiamat and a shape-shifting doppelganger which are two of the most bonkers ideas in this book, with the former potentially being a world-changing effect that is almost glossed over which I find fucking baffling especially how it's mentioned quite a lot in the following chapter. On the other scale, you have a group of Russians by the title of Red Mercury. It's just boringly predictable with a political message that definitely won't age like milk. Before we move on to the next chapter, there's one detail I've omitted that I wish to briefly address. At a few points in between the last two chapters, a full page is dedicated to a few places of interest you may wish to explore and send your coterie to, with one of these being the ruins of Sirios, you know, the OG Tremere Chantry, which is under SI occupation. As interesting the suggestions are, and as shocking as it is for V5's writers to acknowledge the existence of such an iconic place, I am personally not encouraged to send my players there in V5 because the text makes it very clear that there is no fucking point sending the players to go there. It's in ruins, and it is under SI occupation. Move along and play a different vampire game to get the full serious experience, as originally intended. The final chapter is, of course, the storytelling chapter, where STs are told how to take all these ideas as varying as they are, which feels like a more informed and expanded version of the part of the book that is about building a relationship map with blood sorcerers, which I don't object to, just the placement in the book. I shan't deny there are a lot of interesting ideas for the newbie ST to run wild with, including D10 tables that decide on miscellaneous themes and a sidebar to help players refine their character to better suit a chronicle about blood sorcery, which is a nice touch even if it's a little handhold in places. Finally, we have lore sheets, all four of them, which I found to be incredibly disappointing. What is there is decent enough. The Banu Hakim have a lore sheet all for themselves now, as do the thin-blooded alchemists, specifically and blood sorcery users. Tiamat sort of gets a sheet too, but there is nothing for all those NPCs and groups in chapters 4 and 6, which I feel was an incredibly missed opportunity to encourage the players to really interact with these factions with special perks, integrating the content together. You know, like lore sheets were supposed to do? Using my favourite example from earlier, I liked the character Mrs Chopra and her company and was generally interested to see how this is going to be expanded with the lore sheets, as I felt she was a Veroncia, but with for the Banu Hakim, or at the very least, her company seemed like a force to be reckoned with, but there is nothing of the sort here. And that is ultimately my problem with this book as a whole. It has no fucking idea what it wants to be or how to properly to communicate that information. It is unsure whether it wants to make a blood source as backstreet druggies or new age mages tapping into the powers of a fucking earth demon to aid them throwing thunderbolts like it's a v5 wet dream on the average v20 game is supposed to be whilst it is cool having toys to encourage players to make cool 
powerful blood sorcerers with game-breaking powers and summons to make them feel like gods amongst ants, it does place a lot of pressure on the ST to juggle with different powers and ideas and themes that contrast heavily with the restrained world of darkness we have started to see since Renegade took over. There are parts of this book that I feel feel fairly authentic to the V5 experience, whilst others got carried away shoehorning their failed D&D homebrew. One half focuses on the players, the other on STs, and someone just shoved the sections together and hoped for the best, hoping no one will notice the formatting issues and presentation. Blood Sigils is a confused book that at best I would describe as okay. It presents a myriad of ideas to make Blood Sorcery within the 5th edition of the World of Darkness some degree of interesting. If you came to this book hoping to find reworkings of older material as fans requested, you're not going to find that here except in the form of an easter egg with 5 terribly broken creatures that no one asked for and totally unnecessary reimagining of Coldonic Sorcery that may be marginally simpler in its execution is 10 times more broken and upsetting. For every good idea presented here, there are at least two that is either unfinished or rushed. The saddest part of all of this is that Blood Sigils to me does not feel like a book belonging to the World of Darkness but one that is better suited to the Chronicles of Darkness with Vampire the Requiem. And I do not mean that as a slur, it is just that Requiem handles those more street level vampires better as well as varying cultures surrounding the more supernatural elements of Blood Sorcery which I feel Renegade, World of Darkness and Paradox know all too well. And for those of you who are new to the Lore by Night brand and the reviews I occasionally do, I do not do out of 10 scores because they're subjectively pointless. One person's 10 out of 10 is another's 3 out of 5 stars, which is another's minus 42 out of 100, so I shall rate this book pure elemental fire, as that is just as helpful as a proper out of 10 score. To be kept updated, follow the Lore by Night VTM Instagram and Blue Sky pages to find out when we upload each episode. You can also find out by subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking on the little bell, as you'll be immediately notified when the latest episode is live. Until next time, farewell.